we're going to go ahead and dive in. And so I'm calling this debate to order on resolved corporations driven only by profit are immoral. And so first, I'm looking for a speech in the affirmative from Carolyn. Go ahead and unmute. Oh, you already are. Good. You have four minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my opinion is based on my sense of history. And I want to start with Eli Whitney. Uh, you remember he <clears throat> created the cotton gin at the end of 18th century and launched the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the impact was to eliminate jobs, uh, providing profits to the business owners, who in, in fact were the plantation owners, and it resulted in increasing the wealth divide. Then we moved to the 19th century, and you remember the Gilded Age, the industrialists Carnegie, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, they were referred to as robber barons, implementing business practices that were considered ruthless and immoral. But as we moved into the 20th century, there began, there began countervailing initiatives that would bring about a more moral business climate. We decided that it would be fair to fund the federal government mainly by progressive taxes. In fact, the tax rate went to 90% of uh, income for, for high income individuals and as high as 52% for corporations. That was in the 1950s. We enacted new rules concerning how businesses could and couldn't conduct themselves. The Food and Drug Administration was created as was the Environmental Protection Agency. Antitrust laws were passed. The social security system was born and then Medicare and Medicaid, the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act. These countervailing initiatives built between 1880 and 1980 did not really amount to more moral businesses. Rather, it was the action of legislators who represented us who made our version of capitalism more fair, less harsh, more moral. But then there was a reaction against this change. A counter-revolution brought us up to the Reagan years when President Reagan said, government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. And almost everything changed beginning in the 1880s. Our legal system changed, our consensus about acceptable con conduct by big business changed, corporate lobbying increased, corporate taxes dropped, enforcement of antitrust laws shrank, the deregulation of business accelerated, the federal prohibition on companies buying their own stock was repealed, and Wall Street salaries increased by more than 25%, and then later another 50%. Big business was glorified. Now in the 21st century, we've become complacent to the unfairness that has been built into the economy since 1980. Individuals as well as corporations believe that profit and bigger profit is fair at any cost. Only recently have we realized that regulations on banks that were rescinded during the Trump administration could have prevented the recent bank failures. Only recently have we realized that the price of insulin was unnecessarily too high, and we now have a cap that makes it more affordable to the many people who need the drug. So are businesses moral? Could they make way for fair competition? Could they invest in their workers? Could they allow workers to organize? Could they reduce the huge gap between the executives and the workers? Of course they can. While businesses do what legislators allow them to do, I see businesses as immoral. Heavily lobbying for their profits, funding our lawmakers and creating unfair influence on them, preventing them from establishing a moral society that works for all. That's my opinion. All right, jazz hands for our brave first speaker. Thank you. Good, excellent. Uh, are there questions for the speaker? Go ahead and raise your, your Zoom hand if so. Um, Mr. Lindenfeld, go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, I wonder if the speaker is aware of, uh, going back to the cotton gin example, of how much more 
cotton was being produced as a result of the Industrial Revolution uh, than there was before. Uh, I have some statistics here because I've lectured on this in the past. In 1760, 200 and, two and a half million tons, pounds of important cotton uh, a year uh, in England. In 1837, 366 million pounds of cotton a year. That's a tremendous increase simply in the amount of cotton available for clothing uh, <clears throat> and for other things that people use. And I think similar examples could be multiplied in terms of uh, corporations today all the ones that we think of as immoral, we need to ask ourselves how many <laughs> of them produce things that we benefit and use every day. All right, I think that is the question. Go ahead, Miss uh, Carolyn. Yes, absolutely, production increased. My concern was the fact that two thirds of the slaves at that time worked picking cotton and they were out of work. Um, and there were profits to be made, wonderful profits to be made, but the workers didn't get those profits. The plantation owners got the profits. And that's typically today, we, we all benefit from the production. We love it. We love things and we love more things and cheaper things. But we forget that the people at the bottom who are working to make these things aren't really increasing their wages and their livelihood. It's the, usually the people at the top. Ready and uh, one more. We'll take uh, Mr. Krauss. Go ahead and unmute. Ask your question to me. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Chair, I uh, my question is um, the, uh, the speaker um, mentioned the quote from Ronald Reagan's first inaugural about um, government is not the uh, solution to our problem. Government is the problem. I wonder if she's aware of the actual full quote, which is in this current crisis. I, I have not heard that all the times that it's quoted, I don't hear that part of the uh, speech ever quoted. All right. I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, I can address what I believe he was saying, and that was regulation is slowing down the progress of businesses. And that's a nuisance, it's expensive for businesses, uh, it interferes with the kinds of profits that they might make. Uh, all well and good. I understand as a business person, that's not, it's ornery. However, we can think of a lot of things that have been in, made our life better because of the Food and Drug Administration, the EPA, uh, recently the, uh, the uh, Dodd-Frank uh, re regulations on banks. Um, we need, we need government. We need somebody to check the kinds of ambitions that businesses have. All right, um, and I know there was a, some question about that quote too, and so folks can look that up. And, um, but yes, excellent, uh, those good questions and a, and a, a good answer. So um, one more time, some jazz hands for our, our speaker. And with that, she is thanked. And we'll now move on to a speech in the negative. And so for that, I'm looking at Travis. Go ahead and unmute and you have four minutes. All right, thank you. Um, just on the Reagan point real quick, I think it's, it's interesting. You know, it wasn't just uh, kind of annoying regulations that these businesses were having to comply with. I mean, it was a really broad crisis throughout the, the 70s of stagflation, um, a you know, couple of symptoms that basically broke the consensus around what economics was at the time, right? It effectively broke Keynesianism and called for an entirely new understanding of, of economics. And, and they probably did swing the pendulum too far, Carolyn, but a lot of it, you know, there's a lot of truth to the fact that, uh, you know, excessively uh, burdening businesses just doesn't allow them to operate efficiently. And that has huge ramifications for, for the whole economy. So I think that leads in pretty nicely to, you know, how I, at least I think about this issue. Uh, and, and in general, it's not that corporations act immorally, it's that they act amorally, right? They are just a framework of people operating together to, um, you know, that the government and the, the, their customers set for them. So it's not that they act morally or immorally. They're just acting amorally in response to, uh, in response to customer demand. 
And so that's at the end of the day, what a corporation exists for is to serve the needs of the customer. And that's what they're always going to try to do. Uh, and obviously, individuals at corporations can act immorally. And there's plenty of examples of that. You've got Enron and recently FTX, and, and that's not really what we're talking about. If they're you know, acting in secret and it, breaking laws, obviously that is immoral. But what we're talking about here is a, is a company who's acting legally and meeting customer, customer demands uh, you know, uh, publicly, then they're going to be acting amorally. And so historically, customer demand has mainly come in the form of, you know, better and better products. And so companies have tried to meet that demand. And so you see in tons of industries, much better products today than you did 50 or 100 years ago. And I think the car industry is a good example. You know, cars today last two to three times as long as they did in the 70s. Uh, they also run a lot more efficiently. A car going 60 miles an hour today produces just as much emissions as a car at a standstill in the 70s. And so these improvements are because, you know, not out of the goodness of the company's heart, they're doing it to win more customers. And so they're responding to customer demand. Again, that's the only point of the corporation. And, you know, increasingly what you've seen recently is that customers aren't just caring about what the product is that the company makes, but it's also how that product is made. And so they're going to care about, okay, is this product sourced responsibly? And so because of that, now companies also have to think about, you know, is the product good, but also am I acting, you know, in a responsible way such that my customers will respect the way that I'm making this product. And so in that way, they actually end up acting morally, but only because, again, they're trying to meet customer demand. And so what does this all mean? Basically, if you think that a corporation is not acting morally, it's not the corporation's fault at the end of the day. They're just responding to customer demand. Your issue isn't with the corporation. Your issue is with the broader consumer base, i.e. broader society that is giving them demand incentives. And you see this problem a lot where people overemphasize the supply and underemphasize the demand. Um, you see this in you know, the media. People always say, well, why is the media so polarized? Why are they pushing all these polarized narratives? You know, they're just responding to consumer demand. The question should be, why is the populace so polarized? Why is the populace demanding all this sensationalist news? Same thing with politicians, right? Why are politicians so polarized? That's not the right question. The question is, why you know, does the populace demand such polarizing and sensationalist candidates? You know, typically, the demand is really the Ten issue and, and not the supply. And then the corporation is the same way where they're just going to be responding to consumer demand. And so if we really want to solve the problem of what some people see as immoral corporations, I, th I think we need to just look in the mirror and say, what are we as a broader society doing to give these demand incentives to these corporations? Um, and, and, and so that really, at the end of the day, is, is the argument that corporations are amoral and they're simply responding to consumer demand. And so if we have an issue with the corporations, the issue is, is really with us who are giving those demand incentives. I'll wrap up there. Thank you so much. Um, jazz hands, yes, for our first negative speaker. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, we're going to start with um, Dace Hines. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Yeah. Hi, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with some of the things that the previous speaker had said, and I actually wanted to commend him for offering the amorality um, angle for this. That's not one that I had considered. Um, one of the things that I heard him say repeatedly was that the primary uh, purpose of a corporation is to serve the needs of the customer, the demand of the customer. But it's my understanding, and I could be misunderstanding this, that the primary function of a corporation is to return profits to the shareholders that uh, own shares in that corporation. I'm curious if, um, if the previous commenter uh, believes that to be true as well, and if so, how does that conflict with the previously stated stance of what a corporation is for? All right. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so I, I totally agree that the primary immediate concern of the corporation is to return profit to shareholders. Um, and the question is, well, what's the best way to do that? And the answer, of course, is to meet customer demand. Um, and you see that in, you know, the ways that corporations act, right? 
there's this idea that corporations only act in their short-term interest at the expense of their long-term you know, interest. But that, that's not how corporations act anymore, right? Long-term thinking is, is highly valued at corporations. And I work in the corporate world and uh, you know, people talk about this all the time, right? We have to have a long-term plan. What's our five-year, 10-year, 15-year, 20-year goal? Um, and so, yes, obviously your goal is to return profit to shareholders, but the best way to do that is to have a plan for meeting customer demand and, you know, for the long term. And you see that also in, in just the way that, you know, corporations treat their employees, right? Um, you know, since the 19th century, uh, the average working hour for an American has fallen by over 40%. People are working way less than they used to. We have five times the number of uh, days off and vacation days uh, in, in corporate America. And so corporations have understood that actually the best way to return profit to shareholders is to retain and attract talent. And so that's, you know, a long-term plan. Uh, short-termism would be forcing people to work more. And, and that's just not, you know, what, what the data show. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's the immediate goal is to return profit. The best way to do that is to meet customer demand. All right. Great. Um, uh, Andrea Targos, go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Hi, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, my question is just out of curiosity, I have noticed some of the corporations I have bought things from lately have been considered B corporation. And it seems to me that maybe in those cases, they are trying to act more morally. And I was wondering if the speaker has had any experience or can explain how that fits into the picture. Great. Sorry, what type of corporations? Uh, it's called a B, B corporation. And it seemed to me that just what I've read on the packages that there, it's a type of corporation that tries to uh, do some good, give back or, or yep. uh, address some issue. Yeah, and 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 I think those are great. I just I just looked it up. It sounds similar to like a nonprofit corporation, also uh, maybe a mix between a for profit and a nonprofit, um, and and that's great. So so a corporation can be set up for any uh, purpose, right? You have corporations that aren't set up for solely for profit purposes, right? Nonprofits, hospitals, these are great examples, um, and they have in their charter. Uh, in addition to seeking profits, we want to provide for the community or do something else. And that's stated in their goals. Uh, most corporations, C corporations, are not like that, right? They're set up just for profits. And the reason for that is that that is something that's very easy to measure uh, and something easy to go after, right? It, it, it's very hard as a corporation to affect positive social change, right? How do you measure that? Um, how do you know you're not doing it inefficiently, et cetera? Uh, and so, a lot of people will ask, well, why doesn't the CEO of XYZ company uh, just, you know, try to affect more social change? And the answer is that in that corporation's founding documents, right, the shareholders who are invested in that corporation, they haven't given that CEO their money to do that, right? That's not the purpose of that CEO. Now, there's nothing stopping from other people starting a B Corp or a nonprofit or anything else um, that does have within it founding document, you know, these good social purposes, and, and we should have more of that. That's great. But if you're going to start up a corporation with the sole purpose of making profit, then that's what that corporation should focus on. So I love B Corps, and I, I think there should be more of them. Uh, but if you have a traditional corporation focused on making profit, um, then that's an amoral entity, and that's fine. All right. Um, so we're going to take one final question, uh, and then... Um, uh, a couple of reminders, then we'll move on. So I know there are a lot of hands up. I would just remind you all, um, I'm going to call on Mark Sari. And uh, for anybody else, questions can be speeches. And also you can save your question and see if it's uh, applicable to the next speaker. So um, uh, so yeah, whatever your point is, we definitely still want to hear it. Um, so Mark, go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Um, Madam Speaker, while I agree with much that the speaker said, um, I think uh, he, there was an overemphasis on demand. I think there is a point sometimes where corporations are manipulating demand. Um, why do uh, some movie companies make movies that nobody wants to see, for example? 
Um, why did the Soviet Union produce uh, goods that nobody wanted to buy? Um, so there are a lot of examples. My question would be, what, what about manipulation of demand, to put it more succinctly? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I think that the simple answer for your two examples, why do the movie industry make movies nobody wants to see? It's because they're, you know, they consist of humans and they make mistakes, right? They might think that demand is X, turns out nobody actually wants that. And so the movie flops, right? But if they put in hundreds of million dollars into this you know, movie production, their thought is that hopefully it is successful. And, and sometimes companies get that wrong. That's why 90% of startups fail is because people are trying to figure out demand, but it's very hard to do. And so the simplest answer is that a lot of times companies get it wrong. Now there are examples also of you know, actual manipulation, right? Where people you know, especially just using marketing, right? That's effectively what marketing is, is trying to make people think that they want, um, you know, a product or service that they don't actually really need. And, you know, that that's a tougher question that delves into psychology. I think at the end of the day, we have to trust that individuals are generally going to act in their best interest. Obviously on the margins, there's times where people don't. Um, but in general, you have to assume that in a you know, liberal, democratic, capitalist society like we have, that individuals are at the end of the day going to choose what's in their own best interest most of the time. And if you don't believe in that, then you can't really believe in, in free enterprise or you know, the democratic process, right? Because how are people going to choose the right candidate? And so there are examples where people are going to choose wrong and be unduly influenced. Uh, but I think that that's the exception to the rule. All right, very good. With that, the speaker is thanked and jazz hands once again for excellent questions asked and answered. All right, just a couple of quick reminders. Um, the first thing I think I failed to mention this earlier, but uh, for questions and answers, there's um, you have 30 minutes to ask, excuse me, 30 minutes, 30 seconds to ask and one minute to answer each question. And so I'll, um, I'll guide folks through that. Uh, the second thing is that um, our beloved Natalie, uh, her chat stopped working. Um, and so anyone who has chatted her saying, I want to speak in the last uh, 15 minutes should send that message again. It is working again. But if you chatted to Natalie and you want to speak, she didn't get it in the last few minutes. Um, and the last thing is um, we have a policy of not um, sort of doing fact checking or fact explanation from, from the uh, sort of as the official organizing entity, uh, not because we hate facts, but because we find that people, um, uh, it, it, we need to establish trust before we can sort of try to persuade each other about facts. And so I encourage folks to look stuff up on their own. Um, but we, that's, that's why you won't hear me intervening or clarifying or whatever on those points. Um, and so with that, I am looking for a next speech in the affirmative, and we're going to go to Tracy. You have four minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for allowing me to speak before you. With such rampant censorship today, it is so refreshing that the only rule that we have here is to share what we really think. And that's what you're all going to get from me. Yes, corporations driven by profits only are immoral. This is also known as profits over people or wealth over health. I'd hold corporations to a basic morality of the golden rule, doing for their customers as they would do for themselves. This means making products that ensure the health and safety of their customers as if they were making them for their own families. Unfortunately, however, when company leaders are beholden to a financial bottom line, they can hyper-focus on short-term profits and, rather than the long-term health impact of their products. But in a healthy society, the common source of corporate, this common source of corporate immorality is supposed to be kept in check by the government. As our first speaker mentioned, there's a, a lot of regulations. Our nation's founders understood that absolute power corrupts absolutely, so they created systems of checks and balances. And our elected officials we voted for create those checks and balances by providing us with health and safety laws and regulations. But what happens with an, when an industry gets so wealthy that it can pay off those who would hold them accountable? 
by far the pharma and health product industry pays the most to members of Congress with 284 million in lobbying. Maybe that explains why the pharma industry and the vaccine industry in particular is exempt from what most corporations would have to pay in terms of liabilities for product lawsuits. Don't look to the FDA for protection either. They are quintessentially in bed with pharma. It's known as agency capture. It's known as the revolving door. On behalf of Pfizer, the FDA requested that a judge give them 75 years to release some of the data from their Pfizer clinical trial. Fortunately, the judge said no. And from that data dump, we learned that Pfizer knew in 2021 that in just three months of following people, there were at least 1,200 deaths from their vaccine. That was newsworthy. As of now, 34,000 people have died from the COVID and Moderna mRNA shots. According to the HHS own data, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, which some estimates report is underreported by a hundred times. That means that we could be looking at 3.4 million deaths from these two companies. If you haven't heard this before, it is because the media has also been bought off. Um, as you might have known, COVID is responsible for 1.1 dead. How can this happen? In 2020, so a, a previous questioner talked about manipulated demand. In 2020, we were all scared. We were so scared. We thought this COVID thing was very lethal. And for many, it was. However, the expected death rate was much higher than it ended up to be. Public officials like Anthony Fauci were not scientifically and morally open to all types of treatments, but, but generated the false narrative that only one solution was the answer to our problem, ignoring effective remedies like ivermectin. And there was so much money to be made, Pfizer alone made nearly 75 billion off their MR, mRNA shots and Paxlovid when of course, their own vaccines fail to prevent transmission. The media also would not hold them accountable as they had agreed to a trusted news initiative where they would maintain and collaborate on the narrative that the shots were safe and effective. And finally, my last point, Madam Chair, is that the only recourse of people like me who hold their health of paramount importance was to do our own research and avoid working for companies who required the shot. In conclusion, we cannot trust immoral corporations with vested financial interests, but especially we can't trust them when they're in bed with government in the first place. Our health depends on it. All right, jazz hands for our brave third speaker. Yes, excellent. Uh, we're going to start. Um, so I see a few questions. We're going to start with Lisa Grace. Grace, go ahead and unmute. Ask your question to me. Uh, you need to unmute. Sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, a quick question. Those are really, they were really interesting statistics that our speaker shared with us. I just had a quick glance at the CDC website and I saw a report of 19,000 reported deaths out of 672 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. But might be helpful to have a reference for your alarming statistics? Yes, um, the reference for that statistic is the adverse events, at, at the Vaccine Adverse Events Reaction System, otherwise known as VAERS. Now the CDC does not make it user friendly to go in. You have to do advanced reporting searches. So there's a website called openvaers.com, -E which takes the HHS data and makes it more user friendly. When you go there, you'll see 34,000 deaths. Now it was a Lazarus study from 2009 that estimated that 
1% of everything reported to VAERS uh, is represented so that the actual number could be 100 times bigger. Now, the other studies have said it's 41 times. So I don't think we have an exact estimate, but the CDC's own data report says that it, it knows that it's vastly underreported because it is a passive surveillance system. It is, it is known as an early warning system. The other thing you'll see on that website is that 34,000 out of 44,000 total deaths of vaccine deaths have happened from the COVID-19 shot. So it's represented over two, over, over three fourths of all vaccine deaths from the year 1990 were from the COVID shots. And again, amazing that this isn't on the news every day because it, it shows you the power of the media to sway public opinion. All right, next question, we'll go to Mr. John Kingry. Go ahead and unmute, ask your question to me. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to uh, ask the previous speaker, um, you're saying that corporations are uh, immoral, but you uh, say that the politicians are taking money and being immoral. You say that the media is yes. immoral. Mm -hmm. uh, you've named multiple other groups. Mr. As Kingery, being, I'm just going to I'm sorry. You. Thank you, Madam Speaker. She is. Uh, so I question, uh, how do you view corporations' morality compared to the government, compared to media, compared to uh, websites you're reading, et cetera? Yes, Thank you. you. Okay. I think that when we look at um, the veracity of the truth, it's important to follow the money and it's important to look at conflicts of interest. And when you see time after time on news reports sponsored by Pfizer, you got a question, could that news reporter actually really question Pfizer? I mean, the news, the news has turned into cheerleaders for the shots. That was evident in December, 2020. I, it was sort of sickening to me that, that they were just like, go do it, go do it, roll up your arm. And they didn't play the role that they're supposed to do. They're supposed to be media watchdogs. So yes, the, the media is, is corrupt. They're corporate media. And if you follow the money on Yahoo Finance, there's two corporations that own most competing corporations, including pharma companies and media companies. And that is BlackRock and Vanguard and those two own each other. All right, and then for a final question, we'll go to Ms. Jane Rampona. Go ahead and mute, uh, unmute and ask your question to me. Okay, um, Madam Speaker, um, my mother died of COVID, but her case was not counted because she, um, it was a post-mortem COVID test. And um, the CDC has reported that the number of deaths are undercounted. So I'm just wondering if you've considered that that also is a factor uh, along with possible undercounts of, um, of deaths from other, like the vaccine. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm very sorry about your mother's death. And second of all, um, I don't think we have a really accurate completely accurate statistic in either case to compare the vaccine deaths to the COVID deaths. I do know that hospitals paid, were paid by the government a lot more money to report a COVID death. And I have heard anecdotally of many cases where someone died of a, say a car accident and they were reported as a COVID death because in the minds of hospitals who were hurting financially, because they couldn't do any elective surgeries dur during COVID, which is their bread and butter, they're, they're probably thinking, well, we might as well write it down as a COVID-19 death because it could have been and we'll get a lot more money. So I think that there were some errors in both directions, but given that there was a lot of impetus to scare people with the corporate media and the federal government, I believe that the air is more in terms of elevating the numbers. You don't see on TV, they don't say, oh, these are the, these are the COVID deaths and these are the vaccine deaths. The vaccine deaths are, are not talked about. And that's where the corporations that own the media 
are correct. All righty. With that, the speaker is thanked. Jazz hands for excellent questions and excellent answers. Very good. Okay. Um, so we're now going to move on to our next speech in the negative, which comes from uh, Mr. T Ken blah, blah, Kenneth Freeman. Mr. Freeman, go ahead, then mute, and you have four minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And first, I want to, uh, Madam Chair, just share some kudos to the, the previous speakers. Um, there were an awful lot of good points from the people that were pro the resolution as well as con the resolution. Um, I'll give you my perspective, and uh, I, I'm a graduate of what they call the West Point of Capitalism, the Harvard Business School. So I'm clearly biased in my views, uh, reflecting my own career. Um, I find the resolution needlessly polarizing. I think it inherently implies that profit is immoral, that profit alone is, it is immoral. Um, I look at our capitalist society and I looked up in Oxford's di Oxford dis Dictionary, the, the definition of capitalism. And they defined it as an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit. Um, my, my point of view is that profit is essential. It is not immoral. Um, I would acknowledge there are abuses. There's no question about that. There are some that are caught and people are punished appropriately, some that are not. Um, and I would fully agree that uh, the most senior levels of corporate executive management compensation is out of control. Um, but I go back to the premise of the resolution and would point out that profit is essential to our way of life. Profit, is, the opportunity for profit is what motivates investment. Profit enables investment. And when we look at how we as a society live, we look at our housing, our ab abundant food supply, our life-saving drugs, our transportation capabilities, entertainment to enrich our lives. All those things are enabled by profit-making corporations, and they would not be where they are without the profits the companies have made, which again drives investment. Um, I would remind people on this session that for any of you who have a 401k account or an IRA account, that you likely own shares in corporations. You own those shares to try to benefit from the profits, whether it be through dividends or through selling those stocks at a higher price at some later date. Um, but I'd also point out that to say that companies are driven purely by profit and profit alone is in the main uh, just really, I think, an inaccurate and an unfair perception. Um, a, a recent, well, not that recent, a book written by a couple of Stanford professors, Jim Collins and Jerry Porras, called Built to Last, uh, shared a great deal of research they did on the most successful corporations in America. And what they found was that those companies were founded and largely driven by missions that didn't at all mention profits. Profits flowed from their success at meeting consumer needs, addressing societal challenges. Um, I'd remind people as we talk about the big issues facing our country, uh, and you know the whole issue of climate change is a good example, young growing startup companies that are trying to go after solutions can only do that because they're investors who see there may be an opportunity to make a profit. So profit is really the lubricant that drives so much of the developments in our society. Um, I would point out that corporations, we always think of them as faceless entities, but corporations consist upon the people who work in them. And it, and it reflects very much the leaders of those companies. Um, and those corporations, I think the successful ones are concerned about their employees and meeting their needs. They're concerned about their communities where they operate and being good, good neighbors. I'd point out to the, to uh, Madam Speaker, to the, to the, uh, the speaker who spoke of amoral corporations that I see far more examples of moral 
leaders leading those corporations. I think of incidents like a number of years back with the Tylenol tampering scare and Johnson mm -hmm. & Johnson recalling mm -hmm. all the product uh, across the country, taking a huge financial risk because it was the right thing to do. I see those kinds of altruistic actions regularly. So, you know, in, in closing, I, I would just say that, yes, it's not a simple um, question. There are certainly negatives and problems, but unless we want to live more like the Russians or the Chinese or the North Koreans, um, you know, the, the capitalist system we have is, is a good one. And I think that operated correctly um, can be very much moral in meeting the needs and dreams of the people of our of our society. All right, jazz hands for Mr. Freeman. Thank you. Very fine affirmative negative speech. Um, excuse me. Uh, for our first question, we'll go to Ms. Marlene Scott. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Madam Chair, I am a um, a retired entrepreneur. I ran a twenty five million dollar company that met the needs of our clients. It was part of a $14 billion corporation. And I was the first woman minority to run one to be president in that division. I do and my children run a, 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 a brother sister team in fashion, which produced the outfits for Rihanna's halftime show. <laughs> um, so I am for I don't have a problem with profits per se. I have a problem with how profits are being used and how it is the question, right? So my question is, um, what, why should uh, Bezos and uh, Musk and Gates, uh, their income equal 50% of the American people's income? How can we have such income inequality and not use the profits that we make to provide the basics in our democratic society, housing, quality health care, quality education. I think the money that was the taxation during the Eisenhower period, which was progressive, where if you were a millionaire, your tax rate was 90%. We need to get back into reality of how do we use our profits to profit humankind, our right. environment, and our, and our communities. So uh, also, that's great. I'm going to also cut you off here. Sorry. Um, I would also just remind, I, I hear maybe a little speech in there and like, maybe you want to give a speech. That could be cool. Um, for the moment, go ahead and, and uh, uh, answer the question, Mr. Freeman. Okay. Madam Chair, um, I, I would just address the, the, uh, the, the questioner by, first off, agreeing. I think some of the executive compensation is ludicrous. Um, but I would also point out that the way compensation is reported is incredibly misleading. When you hear what a uh, what an Elon Musk makes, he he actually uh, oftentimes is short of cash because what he makes is going into investments in additional businesses. Um, you know, when they talk about people buying back shares so that the CEOs can get wealthier, they're buying back shares so that the money can be invested more productively in things like new startups and new ventures. Um, there are uh, people who've walked away with tons of money and are doing good things with them. I look at Bill Gates and, and Warren Buffett and the, and the Gates Foundation um, and, and what they are giving to society to so solve societal's, society's problems. So yeah, is it perfect? No, um, but uh, is it all? Uh, greed without helping society? No, I don't think so at all. All right. Um, and then one more question from Mr. Brooks Hilliard. Go ahead and unmute. Ask your question to me. <clears throat> Madam Chair, <clears throat> while I mostly agree with the speaker, also being an HBS grid, um, I think he did not address the issue of the need for regulation um, to, uh, to handle corporate abuses, externalities uh, and so forth. And uh, I think we have to have a regulated um, 
capitalist system, not just a, uh, a laissez-faire capitalist system. And I, I'd like to hear him address that. Okay. Madam Chair, uh, I actually strongly agree with the, uh, with the questioner. I, I think that you do need a regulatory structure. You need one that's practical and that works. Um, I look, for example, at the collapse of, of Silicon Valley Bank, and um, I don't believe that it was a change in regulations that caused the problem. It was management incompetence, and it was the regulatory body, the Federal Reserve Bank, that was not doing its job in monitoring and regulating in a way that they have been empowered to do. So, I, I mean, I agree that regulation is vital. I think it needs to be done in a thoughtful way that looks at the right sorts of measures. Um, so, you know, done right, yes, I would agree that there is a strong need for regulation. All right, and for a final question, we'll go to Mr. Zemlowski. Go ahead and unmute, ask your question to me. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, I, to a large extent, agree with, with the, uh, uh, with the view presented. However, there's one exception. Um, I believe morality to be inescribably linked to free will and freedom of choice. We are moral beings because we choose between what we think is good and what we think is not good, right? And it's and it's and it's highly individual. Every one of us has a slightly different definition of of morality, right? And what is good and evil. Now, when I look at a publicly traded corporation, uh, it is amoral, and the reason is that the CEO really has no choice. His fiduciary duty, his legal obligation, is to maximize shareholder returns. That's what he, he or she is there for. So when the speaker talks about um, responsibility to the community or responsibility to the employees, I would argue that they, none of that exists. None of it exists. And I'm wanting to, I wanted to uh, hear the speaker address this. Madam Speaker, I think that's a, those those are very good, thoughtful questions and observations. Um, yes, the CEO of the corporation, the board of directors, their fiduciary responsibility is to maximize returns for shareholders. Um, I believe that as a part of that, they do need to consider that long-term profitability is greatest when you have motivated employees, you have the best talent that wants to work for the company, when you have communities that want the businesses there. So I think that there is a degree of doing, you know, doing right by employees and contributing to causes of, of, of the community um, that are done, yes, to, to strengthen, um, strengthen the, the, the corporation's relationship with key constituencies. So I think the two can be done um, in a very positive way, which to me is far beyond just, you know, profits for by any means. Absolutely. And with that, the speaker's thing. Jazz hands, once again, uh, these are, I think, unusually good questions and answers. So thanks, everybody. Um, we are now going to, so that's the end of our, our pre-planned speakers. And so anyone, uh, so it's, we will now, I'll now call on a number of folks who have indicated to their whips that they're interested. Um, and so if you're interested in speaking, again, just a reminder to send a chat to your whip uh, and um, the, and they will help you uh, get in, get in line and, and um, get all set up. So um, the other thing we're going to do is because we do have quite a few folks who want to speak, we're going to shorten speeches to three minutes and I'll probably take somewhat fewer questions um, just to get as many voices in as possible. So for our next speech in the affirmative, uh, we're going to go to Robin L. Go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes. Hi. Um, just to keep the competition going, I'm from Yale Business School. <laughs> Um, and I'm speaking in the affirmative on the question tonight. Um, when individuals form a society, they have an implicit contract that they're going to behave in certain ways for the good of e the whole group. Since corporations, as uh, Mitt Romney said, are people too, the word corporations comes from uh, the Latin word for, for body. 
It's a member of society. Um, I think we should have the same expectations of corporations as we have for any other member of society. We don't expect other members of society to just do what's legal and never do what's right. We expect them to do things like keep their word, um, pull their own weight. Don't exploit people who are weaker than you. Uh, admit your mistakes, take responsibility. These are things that I don't see many, many corporations doing, yet they're uh, getting the benefits of being members of society who are distinct from the people that make them up. When a company de declares bankruptcy, the individual members of the, who work for the corporation don't lose a penny. When they're fined, they get to, uh, when they're fined by the government for screwing up something, they get to write that fine off as a tax expense to the detriment of all the other taxpayers in the social contract. So I think it's only fair to expect them to do more than just what's legal, to do more than what is profitable, to look at all the stakeholders, including the members of society who are not necessarily consumers, and live up to those expectations. All right. Jazz hands. Thank you so much. Very good. Yes. Um, questions for the speaker. Let's start with uh, Ms. Hollister. Go ahead and unmute. Ask your question to me. Yes, Madam Chair, I agreed with much of what uh, the speaker said. Um, however, I do want to ask her, what is the responsibility for a company that has exempted liability that has people dying? Like everyone can agree that it's immoral to kill people what should their responsibility be to the families of those who have experienced the death or somebody who's disabled for life? What should their responsibility be? And also in regards to um, Bill Gates, since he is an individual, he, pro he invested 55 million in the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and made 550 million advocating for the vaccines the whole time, and then goes to Australia, makes a speech, oh, they really weren't very effective. He's already cashed in his money. What is his responsibility for the dead and injured? All right, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure we agree on some of the underlying facts of um, some of your questions. questions. What I will say is that, um, I would argue that, that corporations have to proactively prevent harm. Um, if there is harm after the fact, then we have a justice system that can address that. I think proactively, I would say it behooves a, a drug company, for example, to do adequate testing, to divulge their data, um, to make sure that they're not causing harm before the vaccine is circulated. All right, uh, so for our next question, we'll go to Mr. Gilbert. Mr. Paul Gilbert, go ahead and unmute, ask your question to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is, uh, why should a corporation spend money on charity or spend money on doing good things for the community? Um, why shouldn't they in instead, if they have extra money, why shouldn't they instead spend it on doing a better job with our product or service or paying their employees or returning the money to the shareholders and letting their employees or their shareholders decide what they want to do good for the community and how they want to uh, be charitable. All right, go ahead. So that to me seems like a decision for um, the people who are the leaders of the corporation. Um, I think that um, giving money back to the shareholders is something that happens frequently. And I would say that that um, is fine, although they seem to be the only stakeholders that get much of a fair shake. Um, in terms of giving back to employees or um, helping society in other ways, I think that's admirable. I just don't, I, I don't think that 
we can control how the leaders of corporations decide to use extra money. Historically, there hasn't been a whole lot of that. There's a lot of there's a lot of donations that are for public relations, um, not so much any uh, significant percentage of profits of a corporation that have gone back into the society. All right, with that, the speaker is thanked. Jazz hands again for good speaking and good questions and answers. Um, and as I said, I'm gonna have to call in somewhat fewer questions just to get in, uh, as many speakers speeches as possible. So I'm now looking for a speech in the affirmative, uh, excuse me, the negative, <laughs> you're getting that backwards. And um, we're gonna go to uh, Ron Lichtman. If you're still here, go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes. Thank you. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak against this resolution. When I first read it, I was incensed <laughs> and then disappointed. And disappointed because the resolution is so palpably imbued with this one-sided anti-business, anti-corporate leftist mindset that I think it does a disservice to Braver Angel's mission to be uh, bipartisan and depolarizing. So I'm going to make the following points, some of which have been made, and I'll reiterate. Um, I think the resolution misconceives the nature and the purpose of a business corporation. It's an organization of people who share their resources in the furtherance of a commercial enterprise, share the risks, and share the rewards. A corporation is not some disembodied uh, organic force. It's not some rogue Frankenstein that's created and has gone out of control. It's an inanimate object. Therefore, it has no sense of morality. Morality resides in the conscience of individuals. And in a free society, where free, free minds can differ. And we revel in that. So the choices of what is moral conduct and what is not moral conduct um, are hard to legislate and even more difficult and um, unacceptable to arbitrate. So who, who is entitled to decide for other people what is their moral conduct? Now, I don't mean their illegal conduct. We have a convention. Some speaker has said that uh, we have a social contract and we legislate legalities and illegalities. We have a tort system that compensates victims of negligence and imposes or shifts the cost to uh, wrongdoers. All that's fine. Um, but the corporation is essentially, is in essentially and only a collection of individuals, much like I suspect many of us. If you have an IRA, if you have a pension, you're invested in a corporation so that you have a better retirement, you have a better standard of living, one educates their children. And, and those of us are seek and are entitled to maximize the return on our savings and for our work. A corporation that makes no profits is not serving its customers and it's not serving its employees without profits. Corporation cannot pay anybody, doesn't need employees. Um, so my, my principal concern uh, with this resolution is the notion that some outside authority appoints itself to impose their notions of morality beyond the requirements of the law upon shareholders and other stakeholders to say, in effect, no, you may not enjoy the fruits of your labor. We have, we're going to take that and redirect that to what we think is a more moral way of behavior. I think that, I think retirees, I think retirees, uh, savers and corporate owners have the, have the right to earn as much as they can in profit legally, uh, for the future of their labor. And I see nothing immoral about that. All right. Very good. 
um, jazz hands. Yes, thank you so much. Um, let's start for this uh, set of questions with Tyler DeVere. DeVere, uh, go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I My question would be, Madam Chair, is, is just, uh, we, we talk a lot about personal responsibility. I think it, it seems like there should also be the same expectation for corporate responsibility, which includes controlling for their own externalities, um, whether it's pollution or any other kind of effects that they have as powerful en entities on, on the rest of society. Right? Yeah. I didn't, I'm not sure I heard a question. Sure. Sorry. Is it, would you rephrase a little bit? Yeah. Should, should, should corporations not uh, take responsibility for their own externalities? Well, I, um, externalities, I, I believe, is a legitimate area for government regulation. It's the, uh, the classic uh, uh, commons problem. General Electric, in particular, uh, fell afoul of that and polluting the Hudson River and suffered... Uh, great financial uh, distress so we're having to clean it up yes i think uh, that is an area for uh, for government for a government regulation but i i don't see that the obligation um, within the bounds of existing law can be opposed on on corporate shareholders and owners and employees as to say um it's not good enough that you act legally you have to act as we think whoever we are more morally now unfortunately in uh, you know current in the current narrative what is uh, what is immoral is is sometimes just a political agenda it is deemed to be immoral to manufacture guns and Deemed to be immoral to uh, be on one side or the other of various social issues, uh, yeah. the, you know th those are uh, th those are beyond the scope of what I think is cor uh, moral corporate behavior. All right, great. And then for a final question, we'll go to Terry. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you for allowing me to ask my question. So I heard a lot about choice is morality or personal responsibility is morality, but I um, it raises the question in my mind, how did the Supreme Court mm -hmm. decide that a corporation is a person and is actually separate from the individuals that run it? but yet we cannot hold that corporation accountable for their actions. All right. Well, and I think you may be referring to the uh, Citizens United uh, case, but that was, a, that was a specific case on a specific statute and had to do with campaign finance uh, contributions. A, uh, a corporation is, so, any corporation is subject to a large body of federal and state law, uh, corporations are always held accountable, and you know, and because it's good business, corporations are uh, are determined, dedicated to staying within the bounds of the law because fraudulent contact, conduct and uh, embezzlement and financial shenanigans uh, are bad for business. Elizabeth. Uh, Holmes proved that with Theranos and Sam Bankman-Fried is demonstrating it more recently. Uh, and SVB, well, may or may not have done something unlawful. The co corporations are held accountable all the time. Now, much of what we've heard tonight uh, really is a quarrel with our political system that uh, some think laws are not restrictive enough and corporate conduct is not regulated enough. But that is not a moral obligation of the corporation. That is a question to be addressed to our political system. All right. With that, the speaker is thanked.
jazz hands for uh again excellent questions and answers thank you and yeah um so we're going to move on to a negative speech in a moment but just um because this is often confusing i wanted to uh let folks know that the way that we phrase our resolutions is as a statement, but they're intentionally phrased on one side or the other. We try to alternate which side they emphasize um, in terms of red, blue. And uh, so um, there should probably be something that goes with each statement that says like, this is not the position of braver angels. We could do maybe better with that. But I just wanted to um, illustrate that they're intentionally phrased slightly provocatively to help people sharpen their view on one side or the other. Um, some Appreciate the disclaimer. Say, but that's, that's <laughs> the thing that we do. <laughs> so, all right. Um, and I'd now like to call on uh, uh, Jet Vertz uh, for a speech in the negative. You have three minutes. Yeah, uh, let me disclose my background as others have done. I'm 75 years old, retired 10 years ago. Prior to my retirement, I was a vice president at Pratt & Whitney Aircraft, okay? At Pratt & Whitney, we employed 35,000 people. We generated $16 billion a year in revenue, and we produced aircraft engines for US Air Force F-15s, F-16, F-22, F-35, and C-17, all right? Just give you a background. I totally reject the premise that American corporations are driven by profit motive, and it is immoral. I totally reject that. When I was working for Pratt & Whitney, did we make profit? Yes, we have made profit, okay? Typically our profit range anywhere from 10 to 18% every year. So you may ask, why do we make profit? Now, let me tell you three reasons why we make profit. Number one, to satisfy the shareholder of our company, which means any of you own a 401k, IRA, pension, now you are part shareholder of the company. So we were helping to make sure you enrich your investment, okay? Number two, we employ 38,000 people to reward them with their salaries and wages so they could make a good living, okay? We employ people. And number three, we provide the latest technology fighting machines so we can protect this country, protect your freedom. Okay, the profit motive drives creativity, innovation, so we can stay on the top of the latest technology so that no one could beat us, Russians or Chinese, all right? And let me tell you, you know, if you think that you can do better than the companies that we exist in America, that you can be more creative, uh, generate, you know, money to employ people, and give a shareholder their return. I like to hear how you would do that other than the companies that we have as in America. Thank you. All right, Jess hands. Excellent, I appreciate the personal uh, tie-ins as usual. Um, so are there questions for the speaker? Mm, uh, Mr. Jonathan Hatgas, uh, go ahead and unmute, ask your question to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, a lot resonated with me with the last speaker. I am um, I'm curious because it's a theme that's been coming up uh, through several speakers. So I just, um, I guess the question I'd like to ask for the last speaker was, um, there's been a lot of talk regarding 401ks and investments into corporations and um, that profits, you know, help those folks. I would be curious to hear, um, and there was some touch on it about employment, but um, I'd be curious to hear the speaker talk maybe about the the growing wage gap between sea level um, employees and sort of uh, more, I guess, blue collar or lower level employees. Great. Excellent question. Excellent question. Okay. And I agree that we need to close the gap between the blue collar workers and corporate honchos. I, I totally agree. Uh, there should be some sort of, uh, I like the concept of what uh, the guy who made the ice cream company, I forgot the, uh, you know, he said the highest earning person should be 
X number of times lowest earning person in a company. I sort of, uh, uh, you know, like that concept, let's say 20 times that of the lowest working person to the uh, CEO. So that's a good concern, a good question, and something that we need to address. Yes. Great. Uh, Mr. Falk, go ahead. Next question, Alan Falk. I get unmuted. Uh, more of a commentary, if I may. Uh, this is only a time for questions. If you can make it a question, go for it. Otherwise, you can give a speech. Uh, or you can. I'll give a speech when it's appropriate. Thank you. Okay. I really appreciate that self restraint. Most people don't do that. Thanks. Um, so let's go to Dan Trimble. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question to me. Uh, first of all, real quick, I noticed in the beginning of this show, we were in the pursuit of truth. I know there's a woman in this group. Her name is Truth Johnson. So I found it. <laughs> I like I like a background, nice mountain background. That's good. <laughs> See, and you shall find. That's right. So I'm I'm just wondering if um, since the since the corporation is a creation of a government, if the government, if the people decide that a corporation has a responsibility beyond profit, for instance, uh, taking care of the way it's, it's the results of its products end up in our environment or something like that, does the country not have the right to impose a new uh, expectation on a corporation that might be outside of just a profit motive and serving its uh, shareholders? Okay, go ahead. I think that all corporate, I believe that uh, the laws should be constantly upgraded, updated to give those kind of considerations. You know, it, it, if the corporation is uh, immoral or they're polluting, it's due to lack of right kind of gov government uh, regulation. So yes, I, I agree there should be some good uh, regulatory items should be constantly updated. All right, with that, the speaker's thing. Jazz hands again. Thanks, everybody. Um, so we're now going to go to the very patient Harleen. Uh, um, Harleen Michaels, go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all the comments that have been made, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, one of the I am 77, retired teacher, um, pre-K, elementary, high school English, um, and currently live in Southeast Texas Piney Woods. I um, have read Kate Raworth's Donut Economics, and I love the image that we need to change the way we evaluate our country's economic activity, because it's not just based on, to be not just based on profit, but to also consider that if we picture the donut, the kind with a hole in the middle, in the, the hole in the middle represents poverty and starvation and prejudice and racism and war and all the things we don't want for people. And outside the donut are the things we don't want for the planet, species loss and climate change and all that kind of stuff. The sweet spot is, is the donut and economic activity and the laws that you know regulate it need to be focused on that. And to me, that that is the morality that I would like to have corporations follow. And currently our laws don't seem to be really effectively enough um, enforcing that. Living here in Southeast Texas Piney Woods, I joined the Master Gardener Group and one of the local nursery owners said he didn't feel that we could have an organic garden in this area. And it's beautiful. It's Piney Woods. It's nature and greenery all around. But we are upwind of <clears throat> Beaumont and a lot of the um, refineries and he felt our air quality is not good enough. I, I'm aware of Mom's Clean Air Force, a nonprofit for inner city groups where children have asthma because of the poor air quality. I feel too often these kinds of things get swept under the rug, business as usual. It, it somehow is the EPA in the pocket of corporations? I don't know. I do feel that the food in our grocery stores is not nourishing. My husband was at Mayo Clinic <clears throat> years ago in the early 2000s. Yeah, great place. <laughs> and, um, a young British rheumatologist recommended the book Nourishing Traditions to me, which is how to cook if it were 1850. 
It's based on the work of Weston Price, a dentist in the 1930s who noticed the health of his patient's teeth declining. And is like, what's up with that? And realized the farm families who were switching to pasteurized milk and processed food were losing their dental health. He and his wife take a camera, travel the world, go to all kinds of different places, Swiss Alps, the Caribbean, Alaska, looking for people eating their traditional diets who are healthy, um, you know, not wanting <laughs> the ones that are dying out or anything, and taking pictures. Okay, I've never read the book. I've just looked at these pictures. Amazing, gleaming white teeth, full sets of teeth. They have their wisdom teeth. Their jaws are not shrinking. Um, and his, his basic contention was, the book is called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, is that nutrition is essential to health. That doesn't seem like such rocket science exactly, but I feel like our grocery stores and the processed foods and the additives that are put in them are, I guess the health kind of stuff I read, it, it says that it's the fault um, of, it, they are the cause of many of the chronic diseases we've experienced, obesity, heart disease, cancer, on and on. If you don't I have nutrition, you can't build, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Sweet. Um, and I want to, I want to find out more about that. Thank you. Um, we'll take one question uh, from Ms. Tracy Hollister. Go ahead and unmute, ask your question to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was delighted that Harleen brought up this problem with our FDA. Um, approving of all kinds of damaging, polluting things to our body that Europe has banned. You don't get you don't get GMOs in Europe. So my question to the speaker, Madam Chair, is: Is she aware of the extent to which things are banned in other countries that are permitted in this country? And then why does she think that our FDA is so powerless against big food? Interesting. Uh, go ahead, Harley. I actually don't have good sources. My assumption is because they are, the FDA has a close relationship with industry, just as many of our other governmental agencies have and corporate money um, has bought the influence and therefore the regulations are supporting, you know, the easy way to profit rather than um, one of the other groups I came across that I love are indigenous elders of the world have call, formed a group called Wisdom Weavers of the World, WWW, that say the trouble with our modern society is we are trying to do things with our mind instead of our heart. Life is an interdependent web and we don't recognize that. We have a path. Too much of our culture is on a path to accomplish this objective, no matter the cost. And you know there are regulations that try and correct that, but without that basic objective to want to do good in the world, you know, at all repercussions, I think it makes it difficult. All righty, with that, the speaker's thanked. Jazz hands, yes, one more round. Thanks, guys. Um, so we have time, uh, in a second, we're gonna shift to um, lightning speeches. And so uh, I'm gonna call in one more negative, uh, Lisa Grace, you'll have three minutes, and then we're gonna go to two minute speeches and try to get everybody in if we can. Um, Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman, goodness sakes. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, a different perspective, maybe slightly aligned with Travis, but new to what anyone else has said, which is the underlying principle that being for profit is immoral is disproven by a tremendous list of proactive environmental and social stewardship demonstrated by a huge number of corporations around the world, including throughout the United States. You've got 700 companies that have signed up for what's called the Science-Based Targets Initiative to reduce their greenhouse gases at a level that is way beyond the two degrees we agreed in Paris. And I'll try and make sure I use terms that allow you to Google some of what I'm saying. You can look at the we commerce 100 to see companies like Lululemon and J. Crew that on their websites allow you to buy used 
Lululemon or J. Crew garments. Sorry, am I still? No, you're good. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, the RE100 are companies, and there's some almost 400 of them in the United States that have committed to 100% renewable energy use. And I'm not talking about tiny corporations. The companies that made the client com climate commitments, I made a tiny list. Uh, American Airlines and Dell and Kroger's, it's just fantastic. The companies who have not only made that commitment, but you can see their progress. You can transparently see what they're doing to reduce their emissions and how they're accomplishing that. When there was a lot of bad press, so eight years ago or so, about how you couldn't disassemble or repair an iPhone, nobody talked about the fact that even then on YouTube, Dell and HP have repair channels telling users how you can open up a Dell computer and repair your product. Uh, Merck, the life sciences and chemicals company, has transformed their product development process. And you can go to, you can look at, you can Google Merck, M-E-R-C-K. It's K-G-A-A. -A. It's the German company. Fun fact, there are actually two global companies called Merck. But Merck KGAA has changed their product development process so that they examine 47 different sustainability criteria, ranging from the use of toxic materials to animal welfare, to safety, to access to disabled people for their products. So that those 47 criteria are considered at every step of the product development process from the very beginning. There was a terrible all right. Oh, sorry. Got about my, 10 seconds. Go ahead. Yeah. So my main point isn't, I'm not trying to make the point that companies always act morally. Of course, there are some terrible stories. But my point is there are just as many not well publicized stories of companies acting spectacularly morally. And if you ever, my closing point, if you have a question about a particular company, just go to their website and look at their sustainability report. Read between the lines. If you're a person who's like, oh, it's all greenwashing, look for statistics, look for KPIs. You'll find them. There's really good performance. All right, very good. Jazz hands for the speaker. And because we're shifting into our lightning round mode, we're not going to do questions. So with that, the speaker is thanked. Okay, um, this is now lightning round time, which means you get one to two minutes. And uh, we're just going to go through everybody else on the list if we can manage it. Um, so starting with Leah Sargent, go ahead. You're in the uh, affirmative. One to two minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I'll be right to the point. My highest paid job ever was working HR, but it was working HR for a startup. And so I was doing the job where I was performing the exact same tasks as friends of mine who are working at nonprofits and making twice as much. And it was because when I came up with a way to save an hour of time a week, I was saving it for an engineer who made $150,000, $200,000. So that hour was worth much more than the comparable time saved by someone working for someone with lower paid people. Now, I liked that job a lot, not just for the money. I was working for a startup that did genuinely good work. They were helping get remittances from the US to some of the poorest people on earth with less middleman charges and more simplicity. See, So I was really glad to be working for them. But I realized that if my goal was to make money, there were really two paths open. One is finding profits by creating real value and then capturing a small portion of that value. And the other is attaching yourself like a lamprey to rich people. Because anything you do for them is more highly valued and has more money attached to it than when you do the same thing for someone else. And that's why I'm in the affirmative here. Profit seeking alone isn't enough. There are ways to generate real profits by doing real valuable work, but there are a lot of ways to generate similar or larger profits by grifting, performing negligible services for rich people rather than essential services for poor people, that I don't believe profits are the only way to steer. And I certainly don't believe returning uh, value to shareholders is the only way for a company to ask should our company continue to exist? Are we a worthwhile company? It's one factor among many, 
But as several people have said tonight, you know, a corporation is ambiguously a person in some sense. It's made of people, and each of those people is accountable for their stewardship of the resources given to them, the hours that people that they're paying people for. And it's too easy to make a profit while doing something scammy or even just piddling. Um, it would have been wrong for me to look at that experience and say, I want to be a PA to someone really rich, um, you know, and just like help them schedule their lunches or help them like be the interface between them and a delivery person because they don't want to talk to that kind of person and just pull in that extra money because to them it's nothing. A lot of companies do make that choice of catering to the rich, catering to the profitable without creating value, just siphoning money off of people to whom money no longer has any meaning. Right. Very good. With that, the speaker is thanked. And uh, we're going to move on to Don Krauss. Mr. Krauss, go ahead. You have one to two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've been listening very carefully to all the speakers. And one thing that uh, uh, stands out to me as I listen to people who uh, sound like uh, people I've heard arguments uh, both from uh, the red side and the blue side is that the one thing that uh, seems to uh, uh, to unite the red and the blue is in their hatred of capitalism and corporations. And so Braver Angels, mission accomplished. Um, corporations, as people have said, are not immoral. They are amoral. Uh, I actually, in terms of profits, I find comfort in the idea that businesses are motivated by profit because I know what that is. If I would be very suspicious of a company that was motivated by things like racism or misogyny or maintaining a class structure in society. Um, so um, it, it's a it's a it's important to understand. You know the the um, the great uh, high priest of capitalism and free markets, Friedrich Hayek, uh, actually uh, uh, was a very big proponent of what we now call social democracy, because he felt that without social democracy, a successful uh, capitalistic system could not be successful, because there are just a lot of things that corporations should not be doing. Um, so, uh, one of the things I, I heard was um, Mitt Romney's comment about corporations or people. And of course, we remember that because of course it's on its face absurd. Um, the, the idea that corporations are people was invented by a government, in fact, many governments. And the, the idea that we expect moral behavior from something that really isn't a person flies in the face of what morality is. Uh, but exactly. I will tell you that um, governments uh, actually are very useful if regulations are very small and very powerful and well enforced. And so I think what you're looking for are uh, is a lean government that is working for people and motivating corporations to operate because it's profitable for them to operate in the public interest. All right. Thank you. Very good. That the speaker is thanked. Jazz hands, yes, very good. Okay, uh, next we'll go to Suzanne Zilber. Go ahead and unmute. You have up to two minutes. Affirmative. Okay, just cut me off when you want to. Um, <laughs> right. So, so I've been working on revising a workshop that I have have developed on class and classism, and um, I am not Catholic, but I include material from the Catholic Church um, where they talk about. The morality of economies. And in their 1986 pastoral letter on the economy, the U.S. Roman Catholic bishops judged the moral dimensions of an economy with three questions. What does the economy do for the people? What does it do to the people? How do people participate in it? And then 27 years later, Pope Francis suggests what the goals of economies should be. Every economic and political theory or action must set about providing each inhabitant of the planet with the minimum wherewithal to live in dignity and freedom, with the possibility of supporting a family, educating children, praising God, and developing one's own human potential. This is the main thing. In the absence of such a vision, all economic activity is meaningless. And with regard to the proposal, 
Um, I, I do believe that there are probably corporations that do positive good. Um, this proposal is if you're only for profit, Kit, are you immoral? And I, I believe that that would be true. And we see it with like Uber. I think recently, like corporations spend a lot of money lobbying politicians, money that they could just pay their workers instead. I've never understood that. And um, and I see as a psychologist that there are a lot of corporations that have been damaging to my clients, um, the porn industry. Um, is harmful both to the people who, who get sex addictions as well as to the people who have been coerced into the sexual activities that are then sold for a profit. And, um, and so I think that uh, unless we begin to think about the impacts of the corporations, in addition to the fact that they need to make profit, we are going to continue to see grave harm to our communities. And we see it in the US um, in the form of the Gini index, which is a measure of how much inequality is in a country. And the United States has a very high Gini index. It's 49. Your last point, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. <laughs> awesome. You you really did mean that I could cut you off, thanks. Yeah, mm -hmm. that the speaker is, is thanked and the Gini index is in fact an interesting, interesting thing to look up. So thank you. Um, and next we're gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to do this. We're gonna have to shorten to one minute and I'm gonna, um, so, so the ideas make your most important point. Holly Lance, you're next. Okay, well, um, I worked for what was uh, the Upjohn company, which is now Pfizer and, um, and, and, <laughs> and one of the things I wanted to talk about is is the Kalamazoo Promise. It's, they, they, it's in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and six uh, wealthy folks. Some of them individuals, some of them corporations, and I don't because they're all anonymous. They they won't tell us who they are. Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, said they would support uh, any student who graduated from the Kalamazoo Public Schools K through 12 full tuition for four years at a Michigan school, uh, nine, K, or nine through 12 and graduated, they'd also get some money to go to college. So, so this is an example of, of the corporation supporting the community, which I hear people talking about. Um, Obama uh, also uh, came and gave an award to the Kalamazoo Public Schools after they heard about, after he heard about the Kalamazoo Promise. So um, let's see. Um, you're actually about out of time. That's so. that's. I just wanted to talk about Calm's new promise. Thank awesome. you. <laughs> All right, wonderful. With that, the speaker is thanked. Jazz hands. Yes, great. Uh, so next, we're going to go to uh, Quanta Dawnlight. You have one minute. Let's hear your most. Thank important. you very much. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, I want. I like to say that corporations are definitely behaving immorally. Because if you look at what is going on in Africa, the children working in the mines for batteries with cobalt mines, and about uh, five, six very large corporations, including Microsoft, Apple, and Google, Dell, and some others, have been sued in Congo because the children were being poisoned and some of them died. And they are as young as five-year-old. So I think to make profits at the expense of human beings and the environment is totally immoral. And we cannot uh, support. You know, uh, my grandmother used to say, do not eat from the hands of someone who is sad, angry, and very, very, very sick. And every day I feel like I'm drinking tears, blood, and sweat of these little children who are working for my battery. Thank you. All right. With that, the speaker is thanked. Jazz hands. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our next lightning speech will come from Lori Albright. Go ahead. Let's hear your most important point. I would like to lift up um, a book that I read called We the Corporations. It is um, a wonderful history of corporations in a sense before the founding of our country. 
And I just wanted to point out that our founding fathers had great suspicion about the power that unregulated corporations could have. And in the beginning of this country, it was required that they identified the common good that they were going to provide as part of their charter. Now, as the Supreme Court has made decisions when corporations have come against that, the Supreme Court has almost always ruled in favor of uh, corporations and through those decisions has stripped it of any obligation to do anything other than make profits. So I think for me, the issue is balance. There's nothing wrong with making a profit. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when it is extreme, when it's unregulated and when there's uh, wage theft and um, as the previous speaker spoke, all kinds of terrible things, then then that balance is out of whack. It needs to be rectified. Thank you. Very good. With that, the speaker is thanked. Yes, excellent. Um, we will now go to Joe Pratt. Let's hear your most important point. You have one minute. Sorry for the delay. So I've worked for corporations for 38 years, uh, 25 years with a 100,000 plus person corporation. Last 10 years, I don't know if my math adds up for a 2,000 person corporation. I would like to point out that even the lowest paid people in huge corporations often enjoy some measure of security and benefits that they would not find in a sole proprietorship type of situation or as a farm worker. Uh, and, you know, I've had a comfortable life working for a corporation. I'm not anywhere high up on the ranks. And so I just want to point that out. And regarding the income inequality, let's say a company with a $25 million CEO and 100,000 employees would voluntarily reduce his salary to $1 million and spread that among all those employees. That would only be $100 a year increase for those employees. So while CEO pay may be excessive, uh, it may not really... Reducing that pay may not have great benefit overall. Thank you. All right, great. That speaker's thanked. Interesting. Um, let's now go to uh, Terry. Go ahead. One minute. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, my speech is more in in the form of a question, maybe. I would like to question the idea or the, or the premise that I've heard continuously throughout the uh, discussion that the responsibility, the ultimate responsibility of a corporation is to maximize profit. Um, that's actually a financial theory. I hear a lot of business uh, degrees out there. So it's actually a financial theory that's not regulated by the SEC. It's just more kind of a, a common idea. And so the actual first fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility is to the corporation, not to the shareholders. And so if profit is the only thing being pursued at the expense of the other stakeholders inside the corporation, such as employees, the environment, people, how is that not immoral? All right. With that, the speaker's thanked. Interesting. A speech in the form of a question. I like it. Um, let's now go to uh, Alan Falk. One Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of that last question, uh, when you define stakeholder broadly enough, it's hard to find anyone who isn't a stakeholder that mits, makes that decision. I like definitions and we rarely hear them. Uh, first, um, anyone know of, of a company that was created with the entirely single purpose of employing people? Make a list, get it to me. Uh, next, I used to work for a very large corporation which had a circuit they made circuit boards for their own use and they used terrible chemicals that would poison you in a minute and so uh, there was a huge hue and cry in silicon valley about this poisoning so the company reported on the the city water that they brought in what they did with that water in the chemistry and how they purified it and put it back into the city water and it turned out the water they put back into the city water was more, more pure than what they took out. Uh, regarding executive pay, uh, many years ago, business, I'm working on it, M many years ago, Business uh, Week had a comment about how overpaid the CEO of Chrysler Corporation was. This is back in the days of Lee Iacocca. So I did some back of the envelope math and discovered 
that if Lee Iacocca's entire salary and benefits and everything were completely zeroed out and applied to every car and every truck they made and sold, it would lower the sticker price by $3. Now, how much of that do you think is going to rate, rate to the buyer's pocket? All right. Very good. And with that, the speaker is thanked. Interesting. Um, Thank you. That's what I'm yes. here for. <laughs> Great. Um, and so then the final speech I've been told is one sentence. Uh, so Molly Zeff, go ahead. Hi, I'm, I'm Molly. I, I didn't actually promise that you one sentence, but he wanted to know what I was going to say. So I decided to summarize it, try to summarize it for him in a sentence. I don't know okay. if other people later in this had to do it, but there you go. Okay, since I only have a minute, I just wanted to say that at a very high level tonight, what I've heard was a lot of agreement, first of all, this is a speech in the negative, I'll get there in a moment. What I've heard was a lot of agreement, first of all, that corporations do a lot of immoral things. But what I wanted to say is I think that my disagreement with the resolution is actually a matter of semantics. Corporations are full of people, as many of us tonight have pointed out, and people often do immoral things when their main driver is profit. And that's why we need regulation. And people do need to be limited in their actions. Okay, I see someone shaking their head. Maybe you can contact me later about it. And what I'll just, yeah, uh, well, I, I like disagreements. I, I want to learn from it. But basically that um, it's corporate, corporations are taking immoral actions over and over. I used to work in fair trade, the fair trade industry. I know that a lot of major chocolate companies, Hershey's, Mars, et cetera, have used child labor, even child slavery over time, although indirectly. So I have no question about whether corporations are often immoral. Because they're trying, because they're very profit driven. What I wanted to point out is that there's that I, I I disagree with the premise that we should treat corporations as a person with morality. That we should just recognize that at the end of the day, human beings are imperfect, and no matter whether they're made up of liberals, conservatives, or anybody beyond that spectrum that we often represent, that we we need to limit our own actions. I have zero question about that. And I'm also a huge fan of B corporations and corporations that sign on to other kinds of PACs saying that I will take a, a, the initiative to be a more moral organization by, by doing moral actions. But at the end of the day, that's still people taking initiative inside of those bodies. So that's how I want to differentiate here. I know it's just, it's a little bit trivial to end on semantics like that, but let's just not remember that people need to be limited. And I strongly believe that that's the only reason we need regulation. And I heard regulation from both sides tonight, which I think is super important to recognize. Very good. And with that, the speaker is thanked.